Clear communication is an essential skill for umpires, especially when it comes to substitutions. We need to not only know the substitution rules, but we have to be able to clearly and quickly record the substitution on our lineup while informing the opposing coach and the press box of the change. So in this video, we'll cover some key substitution rules along with quick ways to communicate changes. After that, we'll review case plays that may come up in your games this year. Now, if you want to see how well you can do on the case plays before the review with me at the end of the video, you can find a link to it in the description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber from GHSA Baseball Umpire Development and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you're looking for a packaged course for new umpires, either for yourself or for your association, you can learn more about it by visiting our website, umpireclassroom.com. The first step to having clear and quick substitutions in your game comes from the pregame conference and the exchange of lineup cards. Rule 1-1-2 states that the coaches must provide the umpire in chief with the team's lineup card, which shall include the name, shirt number, position, and batting order of each starting player, as well as the name and shirt number of each eligible substitute. The umpire shall not accept the lineup card until all substitutes are listed. There is no penalty assessed. So when you're handed the lineup card at the plate meeting, ensure that it has all the names and numbers listed with no duplicates, along with a starting lineup of nine or 10 players and clear indication of if and how they might be using a designated hitter. We also wanna look for a marked starting pitcher and catcher and that all the substitutes are listed. On that point, you should note that a player who is not listed on the lineup card as a starter or a substitute is still eligible to come into the game as a substitute without penalty. The NFHS wants the substitutes listed because it speeds up the game, but they don't want a player unable to participate because of the coach's error of not listing them. You should be aware if they have not yet already done so, the head coach is going to give a copy to the opposing coach and to the press box. Although it's great to know if everyone is working from the same copy, we only review what comes to us at the plate meeting. Ultimately, Rule 7-1-1 provides some very key details. Each player of the team at bat shall become the batter in the order in which each player's name appears on the lineup card as delivered to the umpire prior to the game. So there's two keys to that rule. The first is that the only lineup card that matters is the one given to the umpire. So in case of disputes, we only use our copy. And second is that they should bat in the order of their names. The rule does not mention numbers because numbers are for easing the ability to distinguish between players. But when it comes to substitutions and batting order, only the name of the player matters. Now, before reviewing how to signal substitutions, I wanna add a few definitions. First, a substitute is a player who is eligible to replace another player already in the lineup and an illegal substitute is a player who enters or re-enters the game without eligibility to do so, or in the wrong position in the batting order, or in violation of the designated hitter or courtesy runner rules. Now, good preventative officiating and lineup card management by the plate umpire should prevent an illegal substitution. So these should end up being very rare. Instead, what is much more common to occur is an unannounced substitution. These are defined in 2-36-2, as a player who, by rule, can be in the game but has entered without reporting. Usually, the coach or player will tell you when a substitution is occurring, but what I want you to know is that just because a substitution is unannounced does not make it illegal. Rule 3-1-1 clarifies by saying, should there be no announcement of a substitution, a substitute has entered the game when the ball is live and a runner takes the place of a runner who has been replaced, a pitcher takes a position on the pitcher's plate. A fielder reaches the position usually occupied by the fielder who has been replaced. A batter takes a position in the batter's box. Now, looking at that definition, I wanna point out a key difference between the NFHS and professional rules. The NFHS rules specifically say an unannounced substitution occurs only when the ball is put into play. So it cannot occur during a dead ball period, such as between innings. We'll get into more detail on this in the upcoming case plays. Now, let's cover how to communicate substitutions. First, I wanna encourage umpires to always stay roughly in the area around home plate when making changes. If a certain change is going to be very complicated, then request the coach to come out to you, 
but we should never go to the dugout to communicate a change. It's a bad look to head over to a dugout in what may be a heated game, and by standing around home plate, you're already at the center of attention for the coaches and the press box, so visibility won't be an issue. Second, to open up communication with coaches, it's important to remember their first names from the plate meeting. If you need to, write it down on your lineup cards, but try to get on a first name basis with your coaches. This makes it much easier to get their attention and helps to create more of a working relationship between you and them. Third, read the room and the level of experience both in the dugouts and the press box. If the defensive team has given up 10 runs in a half inning and you see the coach walking to the mound while a player starts jogging in from the bullpen, you don't need to go talk to the coach. He's already pissed off and everyone knows this is a pitching change. Simply record the change on your lineup card and give a quick signal to the opposing coach and press box. For me, on an obvious substitution like this, it's a simple low wave at the coach and a point at the pitcher, and something similar to that to the press box. Just know if they are decent at what they're doing and it isn't their first time, they'll have already recorded the changes before you make any signals, so don't stress over this type of change. Now, if the change happens between innings, there is a chance that this will be less obvious to the coaches or press box, so in these scenarios, you may just be a little more emphatic in your wave or possibly call their name to get their attention. Ultimately, when we have a single change, we simply get their attention and point at the player that substituted into the game. If the substitution is a batter, runner, infielder, or pitcher, then we signal it by pointing directly at the sub. If the substitution is in the outfield, we still point in that direction, but do it with more of a casting upwards motion to signal the player is further away. If we have multiple substitutions, this is where more care may be necessary. When signaling them to the opposing coach, you can point to the players substituting, or you can simply call out the coach's name and give them the changes number for number, saying, for example, 12 for two or 13 for three. Then when signaling to the press box, we follow the same procedure as we did with a single substitution. We look at the press box, wave, and point to the sub. Then we again turn to the press box, wave, and point to the other sub. A common phrase is that a substitution is a straight change. This means that when multiple subs are coming in at the same time on defense, they'll be batting in place of the fielder they replaced. If it is not a straight change, this will be difficult to communicate to the press box and the coach, and these are the scenarios where you will likely have the coach come speak to you so you can give them the official substitutions as you are recording them. Next, there are some signals umpires like to use that you can consider using but aren't necessary. If it is a straight change, we may signal this by holding out our hand perpendicular to the ground and moving it up and down. If the change is not straight, we may signal it by holding up this. All jokes aside, if it is a more complicated change, worry about getting it properly recorded in your lineup and then giving that change to the opposing coach. You can quickly signal to the press box with a point to the players entering the game, but don't get too caught up on this. The accuracy of the press box and public address announcers lineup does not impact the game and they'll absolutely figure it out as the game continues to move on. In addition, there are a couple other hand signals we can use either to the press box or the coaches. The first is a C, which can be signaled to denote a courtesy runner coming into the game. It's important the offensive team let you know it is a courtesy runner they are bringing in, because if they don't announce it, this would be an unannounced substitution, not a courtesy runner. We also have the option to use a re-entry signal for a player like this, and if we need to explain an unusual substitution with the designated hitter, we can signal who is pitching with this mechanic, and we can signal who is batting with a swing of the wrist. But again, don't get too caught up on these. You can bring out the opposing coach to tell them the change, and the press box will be able to put the pieces together fairly quickly. So now that we've reviewed substitution signals, let's review this week's case plays. Case play number one. The coach of the home team, the coach of the visiting team, the official scorekeeper for the home team, and the plate umpire all have different versions of the home team's lineup that was distributed at the pregame conference. Which one will we use moving forward? The correct answer here is D. We're always going to use the plate umpire's lineup card when tracking substitutions and determining who is or isn't the proper batter. Case play number two. The home team attempts to use Jackie Childs, number 99, as a courtesy runner for the catcher, Art Vandelay. The visiting team coach says the courtesy runner should not be allowed to enter because he is not on the lineup card. 
Is this A, you should allow the courtesy runner to enter the game, or B, you should not allow the courtesy runner to enter the game? The correct answer here is A, you should still allow that courtesy runner to come into the game. Just because the coach failed to list them on the lineup card does not mean they can't come into the game as a legal substitute. Case play number three. Peterman is wearing number four and leads off in the bottom of the first inning. He reaches first base on a single. Lloyd Braun then steps into the batter's box wearing number 22. At this point, the coach of the defensive team argues they're batting out of order. Is this A, this is batting out of order, Lloyd Braun should have batted first. B, this is legal, the next batter is Lloyd Braun. C, this is legal, the next batter is Art Vandelay. The correct answer here is B, this is legal and the next batter is going to be Lloyd Braun. Remember, we use the player's names when determining who the proper batter is, and the numbers are only there to help, but if they're off, they're off. It's not a big deal. Go with the names. Case play number four. The Outlaws are the home team and will lead off the bottom of the fifth with Penny Packer. As head coach Lippman heads to his position in the coach's box, he tells you that if his first baseman Hernandez comes up to bat this inning, Mickey Abbott will bat in his position. The home team strikes out three times and does not report any substitutions. Who is the correct first baseman? The correct answer here is Keith Hernandez. What you need to know as an umpire is that the rules say a coach can't give you a projected substitution that may occur, but if a coach does come up to you and say, if this happens, then we're gonna make this substitution, you don't need to write it down. You don't need to tell him he can't do that. He's just giving you a heads up that if it does happen, you have a rough idea what that changes and can hopefully get it recorded a little quicker. But since we never got to that position in the lineup and the offensive substitution never occurred, for all we know, Keith Hernandez is still in the game at first base. Case play number five. The Outlaws are the home team and will lead off the bottom of the fifth with Penny Packer. Penny Packer singles. Next, Sal Weaver steps into the box and takes the first pitch for a strike. At this point, the visiting team coach informs the umpire in chief that Kel Varnson is listed in the lineup and this is an illegal substitute. Is this A, this is an illegal substitute, Sal is restricted to the dugout, Varnson should take over the at-bat with an 0-1 count. B, this is an illegal substitute, Sal is called out and restricted to the dugout, Varnson should bat next. C, this is an unreported substitution, there is no penalty. The correct answer here is C, this is an unreported substitution and thus it's legal. The key here is that we need to remember we're more likely to have an unreported substitution than we are an illegal substitution. Case play number six. Peterman strikes out to lead off the inning. Tim Watley, an unreported substitute, is batting for Lloyd Braun instead of Art Vandelay. After the first strike to Tim, Coach Lippman realizes Tim is not batting for the correct player. Is this A, the proper batter is Braun since he follows Peterman in the lineup? Since the at-bat is not complete, he can assume the current count with no penalty? B, the proper batter is Tim. He will be followed by Art Vandelay. C, the proper batter is Braun since he follows Peterman in the lineup. Tim is out for an illegal substitution and Braun will now bat with a new count. The correct answer here is B, the proper batter is Tim because as soon as he stepped into the batter's box and the pitcher was on the rubber with the ball in play, at that point, he becomes an unreported substitution. It's not batting out of order, it's just that's where he's gonna bat now and he's now that official substitute. So there's nothing the coach can do to move the batting order around. This guy is now your legal batter. Case play number seven. The Outlaws finish their at bat in the bottom of the second inning. While waiting for Varnson to come out of the dugout, Newman goes to the mound and throws a warm up pitch to the catcher. Then Varnson gets to the mound and throws two warm up pitches. The coach of the opposing team argues that Newman became an unreported substitute when he threw a warm-up pitch and must face a batter. Is this correct? The correct answer is no, this is not correct. Remember, the NFHS rules are very different from the professional rules. In NFHS baseball, just because a kid goes and messes around and thinks they're just killing time and throws a ball from the rubber, that doesn't make them the pitcher of record because it only happened between innings, which is when we have a dead ball. The only time he would become an official pitcher would be if he's up there, when the ball is put into play to start the inning. Case play number eight. In the bottom of the fifth, it has become very dark and the plate umpire requests the lights for the field to be turned on. The coach of the visiting team argues that it's unfair and they should not be allowed to turn the lights on until the inning is complete. 
Is this A, the umpire may request the lights be turned on at any point, or B, the visiting coach is correct and the lights cannot be turned on until the inning is over? The correct answer here is A, the umpires can request the lights to be turned on at any point. Now, you need to know where you're working and what the situation is with that field. A lot of coaches don't want to turn the lights on unless it's absolutely necessary. But if it's a game that you know is going to go late enough into the night that you have to have lights to finish it, then don't be afraid to have them turned on a little bit on the early side so that you don't need to make adjustments in an inning. And when you're signaling this up to the press box, simply get their attention with the wave, point up, and maybe do a little circle looking at the lights to let them know, hey, turn the lights on for us. So there you have it, our review of substitution rules and signals for NFHS baseball. If you found this video helpful, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out our website at umpireclassroom.com. As always, thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you on the field.